our second speaker. This is John Nevada from Kagoshima University, who is going to be introducing a better learning experience through program evaluation. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess the title probably would have been better as creating a better learning experience through collaborative program evaluation. It's very much what Francisco was talking about. I couldn't have thought of a better setup to my presentation. And his uh, had a lot of theory in it. Mine has almost no theory in it. And it's very practical. It's sort of basically, this is what we did. It went pretty well. And I thought I'd offer it to you guys something maybe you want to do. First of all, just a quick show of hands. Um, have you ever engaged in collaborative program evaluation before? One person, two, I'll give that a couple, three, okay. Um, I've been working in Japan about 25 years now, and I realized before I started this uh, project here that I had never, ever done this. And after a while, it seemed to me strange that I had never, ever done this, because it seems so obvious that you create a program, you create a curriculum, you should evaluate it. And I know that some of the universities I've worked at, we had, did evaluate it. But it was usually one or two or three professors that sat down and said, no, oh, I, I like language learning strategies, so I'm going to put language learning strategies in. Or I like extensive reading, so we're going to scrap all these other things and put extensive reading in. And there was no collaborative aspect to this. And uh, I thought that was kind of strange too. So I started the project. And as I went through, let's see, ah, yeah, yeah, as I went through, I realized that very good reasons to start collaborative program evaluation this day and age. Uh, one is that there's a lot of research into teaching and learning. There's more than there used to be. Okay, that's one reason. And I'll go through quickly just some real basic examples of that. The other is that there's a lot of, no, I can say a lot of, but there's a significant amount of university data compared to when I started working 25 years ago in Japan. So you put these two together and you might come up with something good, is what I thought. Uh, this first example here is just uh, two books that these are not the only two books that exist. There are many books that exist. Here are just two that, for me, were personally very important. One is uh, by John Hattie, a um, very famous professor, uh, called Visible Learning for Teachers. And the other is a little bit more popular, sort of a bestseller, I guess, in the education field, uh, Make It Stick. But this is also by uh, three very famous uh, professors in education. So. Just to give you an example of some of the stuff that is in the research literature. Uh, John Hattie's book, the one I just uh, showed to you. He has uh, a list, actually, very interesting and useful list of higher impact influences. Well, not even just higher impact, but all the influences on achievement. And he's gone through, interestingly enough, and created a meta-analysis of this. And you see all these charts in the book, and it really does show you, oh, well, this is what works. And this is what works a little bit, but maybe not worth concentrating on. So I just put up just a random sample of things that maybe, since most of us are probably English language teachers, things that might be useful for our classroom. Um, first one, I put in red because I think it's very much connected to what I'm talking about today, that uh, collective teacher efficacy. And this became first on the updated 2018 list of factors. So you know, when the book was published in what, 2014, 2015, somewhere around there, it wasn't on this list. But on the updated list, all of a sudden, it's first place as a higher impact influence on uh, learning achievement. And if you look into it, I think it's very much connected to what I'm talking about here, about collaborative program evaluation. Some of the other things, student expectations, formative evaluation, classroom discussion, scaffolding feedback, uh, comprehensive instructional program for teachers, there are things we've heard about. Okay. And I just want to show you that there is a, a lot of research out there on learning and teaching. 
So you really shouldn't be avoiding that. Now let's see the next slide. Ah, well, next slide is about university data. Okay, there's much more university data than there used to be. Still not enough. I would still like to have seen more and better data, but from my university, Kagoshima University, we actually had about 10 different data sets, basically. These are the ones that as we went through, I thought we were consistently using um, to evaluate our program. The first one, the syllabus. We have a sort of generally standardized syllabus. About half is what the teacher writes, half is just standardized. Um, GTEC results, and this is not an advertisement for GTEC. I really don't like GTEC all that much, but the results are there. Um, and it would be a shame not to use them. They were really our only truly test-related results. We are involved in the IR consortium survey, if you know about that, and we have those results. They gen generally come about a year late, so you have to think of that. There's a lag in, in, in this. Uh, survey of students who graduated, unfortunately, this is like a four or five year lag. So it's hard to say what is important. What we found about with this is that our program is getting better compared to four or five years ago, but we still aren't sure how much because the data is still about four years old. Um, English class surveys, this one's rather important, I think. Um, and especially when you compile it together and you look at each, uh, we have English one, two, three, and four, basically, and each class in what the students think of this, their satisfaction rates, how much homework they're doing, some of the comments they write down. And finally, we have a textbook list that uh, is tied into a lot of these. Okay, so this is the data that we mainly use. And you see at the bottom it says that, well, Japanese institutions are particularly weak in terms of educational information disclosure to the public. I would say also to the teacher. <laughs> um, some of these things you would think they would be automatically sent to me as the head of the program, but they aren't. Or they are one year and not the next year, things like this. And so to get these, it took me, not, it wasn't impossible. And they eventually gave me everything. But it took a little bit of time and wandering around to different offices and asking them for these uh, results. And also the preparation of infrastructure for data utilization. and. A lot of the stuff wasn't necessarily in the kind of form that we could easily use. A lot of it wasn't raw data, but it wasn't data that you could, in a group, just sit down and look at and say, oh, look at this. A lot of it we sort of had to put together ourselves, which is a little bit unfortunate. But still, I think there's a lot of data out there. Um, it would be a shame not to use it. Talking about other universities that have all of this approach, I did find two universities that seemingly, I, I have no background information on this, but I did find papers written uh, about evidence-based collaborative program evaluation, one at Okayama University, one at Ibaraki. It's interesting to me that they're both national universities, and I work at a national university. Maybe that says something about national universities, uh, I'm not sure. here with uh, John Norris and Davidson McKay also. These are just uh, two very uh, useful books. I used the green one over here, Davidson McKay. Uh, I use this one too, but for some reason I lean on the green one. Um, and you can basically read through either one or both and come up with your own idea for program evaluation. Uh, and I think the theoretical part, Francisco already talked about a bit. Uh, let's see. Ah, going to the green one that I used. This was in the green book. Um, and it just basically lays it out step by step. Uh, the structure of an evaluation plan generally includes introduction and program description, list of stakeholders and stakeholder engagement plan, 
users and uses, evaluation or project questions, uh, indicators and information sources, analysis and interpretation, plan for disseminating and using evaluation <coughs> findings, and a timeline. Okay, we didn't do this in this order. Actually, the timeline came up much higher, uh, but um, yeah, we basically thought of all these things before we started. Okay, it required a good bit of communication. Uh, a lot of walking around and telling people this is what I'd like to do, is this okay? And making sure that people were on board and also making sure that they weren't threatened in any way. That this was not an attempt to take the previous curriculum and just throw it out the window. It was an attempt to make it better. And it worked, I think. So there's a lot of information out there and if you want to try it, just waiting for you. Advice from experts. Okay, from some other experts. Uh, there's a lot of advice out there. Uh, Belvin here he gives some ideas like commit to the group, which we did, I think. Everyone attends, all 12 of us. There are 12 of us in the English. Foreign languages has 17, but in English there's 12 people. And we all attended monthly, which I'll explain later, monthly uh, meetings. Negotiate the rules. I had the rules set down, no problem with that. Assign rules. This is important. Everybody had some kind of role in our team project. It wasn't just me, it wasn't just a few teachers, it was everybody did something. Everybody listened, and I think the last one, focus on positives. Very important to continually be positive throughout the process. Um, we're doing this together, we're making it better. Focus on the good things. If there are disagreements, there will be disagreements, but everybody in the end should just understand that their opinion was heard. Noonan was the only one I found that uh, really is sort of a language teacher. Uh, basically, he said effective curriculum development is largely a matter of effective teacher development, and curriculum change will only find its way into the classroom if teachers themselves become the principal agents of curriculum change through critical analysis and reflection on the current Basically, this what I found is we had a curriculum, but as one teacher said to me before that new curriculum was put in, before I got to the university, it was put in the year before, um, said nothing changed. The curriculum changed, but what the teachers did, nothing changed. And that suggested to me that nobody was really looking at the curriculum, and nobody was really following. I can't say it was the best curriculum, but it wasn't the worst either. It's just Everybody just kept on doing the same thing. Um, but yeah, you really have to get the, the teachers involved. That is one point here I found. A lot of these are what to do type uh, books. I did find one case of what not to do. Um, full in here down. Here. Four wrong strategies for improving student outcomes. Accountability, i.e. test results. If we based it all of this on GTEC, we would have had problems. Um, our GTEC results are basically flat. And we know the reason they're flat, but if we just said they're flat and we're failing, that would have been a problem. The reason they're flat is, is for other reasons. Um, so I wouldn't focus on test results. We did put them in there, but I don't, I don't think you would want to use that as a key source of your data. Individual teacher solutions, I don't think, would work. Reliance on technology. Um, some, well, not one of the teachers in our group, but one of the administrators said, well, why don't you switch over to e-learning? And you can just get them to do his homework type thing. Um, we do have a little bit of e-learning, but I think reliance on technology would be a bad approach. Um, fragmented piecemeal strategies also. So, there's a whole lot of data out there. Um, going on to the next slide. Okay, here's what what we did at Kagoshima University, general education, English program evaluation. Uh, I tried to make the questions as simple as possible. So, what knowledge and skills have students acquired? What evidence do we have of this? And looking at that evidence, how can we improve the program? Timetable. I'm very happy with the timetable. 
um, we did our English 1 in April, English 1, 1A in April, 1A and 2A in April, actually. 1B in May, 2B in June. Basically, about an hour for each one. And this would handle all of the first year classes. And what I was really happy with uh, was that we did the summary and final evaluation of first year classes in July then. So I wanted to take the pressure off of, we're in this meeting, we have to decide, and there's always going to be someone who is very strong and will voice their opinion, and they will win. I wanted to get away from that and just say, okay, if that person is going to be strong in that meeting, we still haven't decided this yet. It's going to be decided later. And for some reason, we had no problems. I was very surprised. I think it was because of the timetable. We did it slowly. We sat down and talked about it. So basically, in July, we said, OK, this is, we have minutes of our meeting. So this is what we decided in April, May, and June. Is everybody OK with this? And they were, surprisingly. And then basically, second semester, we tackled the second year. English classes. And again, I think one secret was to not put all the pressure on deciding at this meeting and doing it slowly and a lot of cooperation involved. Uh, the results. Okay. This is what we decided on doing. Do I have a I'll get more time yet? Okay. We decided on the following. Um, edit, rewrite the syllabus to make it clear and simple. We had a very long syllabus, and it was a, just a mishmash of key words that the university had told us to throw into our curriculum at some point. And I would read it, students read it. I didn't understand what I was supposed to do, and that's one reason why all the teachers were doing just whatever they had done before. And we sort of knew what, what the new curriculum was about, but we didn't really, so we just cut the curriculum, not cut the syllabus down, to make it clear and simple, at least for us teachers. I'm sure the students still don't read it, but at least we know this is our curriculum. Um, and so now we're able to follow it much better, I think. Uh, it requires 60 to 90 minutes of homework per class. This actually came from up above, but we, we kind of like caught on to it too, thinking this language class is what you really need is time, and we can't increase the number of language classes, so the best we can do is increase the homework. We're required to have 60 minutes by uh, next rules, uh, but we thought, well, it's very hard on the uh, surveys to get exactly 60 minutes from every teacher, so we sort of said, well, we tell them it's more like closer to 90 minutes, maybe they'll some of the teachers who are not really putting in a full 60 minutes will put in closer to 60 minutes. Um, the next one, increase the uses of e-learning. The example is X reading. We had absolutely no um, extensive reading in our program. And some of the teachers, including me, thought that was a shame. And we have a very small extensive reading library. So we thought, well, X reading um, what, it wouldn't have to be X reading. but some program like this would work pretty well. We've already got a textbook list and everything, so we can't really do a dedicated extensive reading class, but it works very well as a supplement. Uh, and increasing Manaba, the uh, learner management system uh, that we, I think the year before we started this, they put that in, and a lot of teachers were just not on board with it. There were problems. Uh, there were reasons why. One is a lot of teachers still liked Moodle better than Manaba. The other is a lot of teachers just didn't know what to do. So we we realized that that was a problem. We set up some FDs and we got teachers talking to teachers in our uh, evaluation sessions. We've been able to do that. Uh, flexibility with the textbook list. A lot of teachers were complaining that. They felt constrained and they didn't feel creative with this, so 
everybody thought that was a good idea to just increase the number of textbooks that you can choose from. Uh, focus on our mission to serve first and second year students. We had some graduate level classes, not many students in those classes, and they didn't seem very productive. So we are general education, we thought our mission is to be serving first and second year students, so we cut the graduate level classes out. Uh, we institute a syllabus check every year. We never had that. At least 10 years ago we had it with somebody got rid of it at some point. Student surveys, we're going to analyze them more carefully for problems and continue for with G Tech for now. Actually, we just cut G Tech, I think, recently. Continue with FD twice a year. It's worked out really well. And we were able from this to discover problems that a lot of teachers have that we could then use for our FD sessions. It's been a really nice transition that way. Continue with our very small language lounge. These are some of the things. Uh, not thinking about the benefits. Well, classroom benefits, teacher to teacher skills transfer. Like I was talking about Manaba, how some teachers taught other teachers how to use Manaba. Some teachers taught other teachers how to use X reading. Uh, a lot of you know teachers would say, I have problems with this class. Other teachers would say, Well, this is what I do. Try it out. Uh, so I think we've got to improve teaching and improve learning, perhaps. The program. A lot of more empowerment, ownership by the teachers, better group dynamics in our group of 12, much better group dynamics, increased confidence in what we're doing. We know what we're doing now. Uh, raised awareness of the problems. And university side accountability. I, I use this word, well, there's several different nuances to this word. I actually set up the program as a counter to the kind of strict accountability that we have at the university, which is basically numbers and things like that. I wanted to do something good, not something that was just a checklist type thing. So the fact that we did it, the university looks at us and says, oh, you did it, okay. Fulfillment of the PDCA cycle, uh, again, we were probably in the C section with our new curriculum, check section. So that's another thing, sort of like, I did it for us, we did it for us, but the university always gets a benefit by being able to tell people that, oh, we're following the PDCA. Uh, the countermeasure to reform fatigue also, I think, which was really my general idea, that a lot of reforms come into national universities every few years. We get money and then it's taken away and things like that. So I was getting tired of that. And we needed to sort of take control of our own program. I think that's something that came out of it. Um, here's definition of program evaluation, which I think we sort of fulfilled. And finally, I think we're right about the next one. I know. And the last one, this is, okay, if you haven't gotten enough from my presentation, I wanted to find one very short reading um, that you might be able to uh, use. And I, I, this is one of the art short articles that I started with and easy to find. I found it on my, uh, the university uh, signs up for these database things and I found it on my easily. So it should be at your university too, library database. Uh, John Norris put out an article about 20 pages long in the Modern Language Journal. And I think this pretty much explains everything easily. And if you wanted to go further, like I said, there's a lot more information out there. And so, from my point of view, by Mr. Yeah, I would like to thank Mr. Francisco. Thank you.